Part 1. Phantasms at Work Reader's note. This section opens with a quote from Giordano Bruno. I will not punish your ears with my non-existent Italian. But Google Translate renders it something like It suppresses the eminent and raises the low which the infinite machines sustain and with fast, mediocre and slow vertigo, dispensation in this immense mass how hidden it is and I stand still. Chapter 1 History of Fantasy Section 1 On the Inner Sense Some Preliminary Considerations Our civilization is born of the conjunction of many cultures whose interpretations of human existence were so at variance that a huge historic upheaval along with a fanatic faith were necessary to achieve a lasting synthesis. In that synthesis, matters of diverse origin underwent a reconversion and a reinterpretation marked by traces of the predominant culture of the period, the culture of a conquered people, the Greeks, enhanced by a conquering people, the Romans. In Greek thought, sexuality was usually a secondary component of love. While granting a link between sexuality and reproduction, no emphasis was placed on a natural cause, which assigned to the former a purely generative goal. It is also true that woman's role as instrument of reproduction involved no intimacy between the sexes based on love, but rather a liaison based on politics. The fruit of intercourse was to become a new citizen useful to the state, a soldier or producer of soldiers. Profane love, that of an Alcibiades for instance, was a mixture of physical attraction, comradeship and respect inspired by exceptional qualities. A strong attraction more characteristic of a homosexual relationship. Plato, undaunted by the banishment of poets from his ideal city on the pretext that their uncontrollable poetic fervour conceals a danger to the state, certainly poses the question of the social usefulness of the tremendous emotional power that Eros is. The kind of love that Socrates teaches in Plato's dialogues represents a gradual elevation in the nature of the human being from the signs of beauty apparent in the physical world to the ideal forms whence those signs derive, the intellectual cosmos which, as a unique and indivisible source of the true, the good and the beautiful, also represents the ultimate goal to which he aspires. Love is the name of that desire with many manifestations which, even in its most decadent form, admixing sexual attraction, still retains its quality of unconscious aspiration to the transcendental beauty. Plato, probably the philosopher with the greatest influence on the history of Western thought, separates the sphere of genuine love from the respective and insuperable spheres of sexuality and reproduction by endowing Eros with the status, very important though indefinite in the ideal order of things, of link between existence and the essence of beings, ta onta ontos. The supreme lover is the philosophos, he who loves wisdom, that is to say, the art of elevating himself toward the truth, which is also goodness and beauty, by detaching himself from the world. Both as conscious attraction and as unconscious yearning, even profane love for Plato is imponderable. In any case, Physical desire aroused by the irrational soul and appeased by means of the body only represents in the phenomenology of love an obscure and secondary aspect of love. The body is just an instrument, whereas love, 
even the kind with a sexual goal, stems from the powers of the soul. In sum, the maiutic endeavour of Socrates puts the emphasis on the convertibility of all love, even physical, that is, psychophysical, into intellectual contemplation. Aristotle does not question the existence of the platonic soul-body dichotomy, but with an interest in the secrets of nature, he feels the need to define empirically the relations between those two separate entities whose union, almost impossible from a metaphysical point of view, forms one of the deepest mysteries of the universe. The coming of Aristotle, who was probably inspired by the medical theories of Sicily or Empedocles, produces two results of incalculable importance to the history of Western thought. On the one hand, Eros will be envisaged in the same way as sensory activity, as one of the processes involving the mutual perceptible soul-body relation, thus removing it from the unconditioned dominion of the soul. On the other hand, and as a result, the erotic mechanism, like the process of cognition, will have to be analysed in connection with its spiritual characteristics and the subtle physiology of the apparatus which serves as intermediary between soul and body. This apparatus is composed of the same substance, the spirit, noima, of which the stars are made and performs the function of primary instrument, proton, organon, of the soul in its relation to the body. Such a mechanism furnishes the conditions necessary to resolve the contradiction between the corporeal and the incorporeal. It is so subtle that it approximates the immaterial nature of the soul, and yet it is a body which, as such, can enter into contact with the sensory world. Without this astral spirit, body and soul would be completely unaware of each other, blind as each is to the dominion of the other for the soul has no ontological aperture through which it can look down, while the body is only a form of organisation of natural elements, a form which would disintegrate immediately without the vitality ensured it by the soul. Finally, the soul can only transmit all vital activities, including movement, to the body by means of the proton organon, the spiritual apparatus located in the heart. On the other hand, the body opens up to the soul a window to the world through the five sensory organs whose messages go to the same cardiac apparatus, which now is engaged in codifying them so that they may become comprehensible. Called phantasia, or inner sense, the sidereal spirit transforms messages from the five senses in phantasms perceptible to the soul. For the soul cannot grasp anything that is not converted into a sequence of phantasms. In short, it can understand nothing without phantasms. Anoi phantasmatos. This passage is rendered in Latin by William of Merbeck, translator of Aristotle, as follows. Numquam sine phantasmate intelligent anima and St. Thomas uses it almost literally in his Summa Theologica, which was of enormous influence in the succeeding centuries. Intelligere sine conversione ad phantasmata est anime praeter naturam. The sensus interior, innocence or Aristotelian common sense, which had become a concept inseparable, not only from scholasticism, but also from all Western thought until the 18th century, is to keep its importance even for Descartes and reappear, perhaps for the last time, at the beginning of Kant's Critique of Pure Reason. Among philosophers of the 19th century, it had already lost credence, being changed into a mere curiosity of history, limited to books specialising on the subject or becoming the butt of ridicule, proof that in intellectual circles it was not forgotten at all. Without knowing that, for Aristotle, intellect itself has the nature of phantasm, that it is phantasma tis, it would be impossible to grasp the meaning of Kierkegaard's jest, pure thought is a phantasm. Fundamentally, all is reduced to a question of communication, 
body and soul speak two languages, which are not only different, even inconsistent, but also inaudible to each other. The inner sense alone is able to hear and comprehend them both, also having the role of translating one into the other. But considering the words of the soul's language are phantasms, everything that reaches it from the body, including distinct utterances, will have to be transposed into a phantasmic sequence. Besides, must it be emphasised, the soul has absolute primacy over the body. It follows that the phantasm has absolute primacy over the word, that it precedes both utterance and understanding of every linguistic message. Whence two separate and distinct grammars, the first no less important than the second, a grammar of the spoken language and a grammar of the phantasmic language, stemming from the soul, itself phantasmic in essence, intellect alone enjoys the privilege of understanding the phantasmic grammar. It can make manuals and even organise very serious-minded games of phantasms. But all that will be useful to him, principally for understanding the soul and investigating its hidden potentialities. Such understanding, less a science than an art, because of the skill which must be deployed to catch the secrets of the little-known country where the intellect travels, involves the assumption of all the phantasmic processes of the Renaissance, Eros, the art of memory, theoretical magic, alchemy, and practical magic. The Phantasmic Noima The Aristotelian theory of the Phantasmic Noima did not come out of the blue. On the contrary, it can even be said that there is nothing original about it except for the way the pieces composing it are fitted together. The system is that of the philosopher of Stagira, though the elements of the system pre-existed. Using A.B. Warburg's expression, the selective will may be attributed to Aristotle, but not to the creation of the substance of that tenant. To recall the important periods of the history of the phantasmic noima, as we are doing here, is not merely a collector's foible. It is because they were satisfied with Aristotle and had lost sight of that history that interpreters of the Renaissance, even the most astute, never grasped the essence of many spiritual processes, nor their basic unity. So long as the phenomenon itself was not understood, all the erudition in the world is useless, for what it can do comes down to very little specifically to perfecting our knowledge about the existence and manifestations of a phenomenon without, however, broaching the much more important problem of the cultural presuppositions that keep it in existence at a given time. The doctrine of the phantasmic noima is not an isolated oddity produced by the gropings of pre-modern science. On the contrary, it is the principal theme that will help us to understand the mechanics and goal of that science, as well as being the horizon of hope towards which human existence stretched for a long period in the past of our species. As early as the 6th century, the Sicilian physician Alcamenon of Croton, like the Pythagoreans, speaks of a vital noima circulating in the arteries of the human being. The relation of blood to noima, the latter being the subtler part of the former, becomes common ground for the school of Sicilian medicine, whose chief is the famous Empedocles of Agrigentum, the 5th century Greek medicine man. As Iatromantus, healer, Iatros, and soothsayer, Mantis, Empedocles was known as the greatest specialist of antiquity in the treatment of catalepsy, apnus or apparent death. We do not know what Empedocles thought of the vital noima, but the members of the school who acknowledged him as leader believed spirit to be a subtle vapour from the blood moving about in the arteries of the body, whereas the venous circulation was set apart for the blood itself. The heart, the central depository of the noima, holds first rank in the maintenance of the body's vital functions. 
Though less refined than the theory of the Pranas in the Upanishad, the Sicilian doctrine closely resembles it in making use of the concept of rarefied fluids to explain organic functions. As I have shown elsewhere, it is from this subtle physiology, or alongside it, that the mystical theories and techniques are developed in which the heart, or the heart's place, plays a fundamental role. The Cos school of medicine, founded by Hippocrates, a contemporary of Socrates, differentiated itself from the Sicilian school by ascribing to the Noema another origin and another location. According to the Hippocratics, the arterial noima was merely the air breathed in from the environment, and its centre was the brain. The doctrine was transmitted by Praxagoras of Cos to his disciple Herophilus of Alexandria, and Dallas contributed to the synthesis worked out by Erasistrates, a younger countryman of Herophilus. Erasistrates, whose opinions have come down to us through the writings of Galen, tries to reconcile the views of the two medical schools by propounding the decentralization of the noima. To satisfy the Empedocleans, he makes the heart's left ventricle the seat of the vital noima, Zotacon, and, in order not to oppose the Hippocratics, he locates the psychic noima, Psychicon, in the brain. The right ventricle of the heart contains venous blood, whereas the noima circulates in the arteries, but, according to the Hippocratic theory, is merely air inhaled from the outside, a theory not endorsed by Galen, for whom the arteries contain both blood and noima mixed. If only for the fact that they are probably repeated by Plato, the principles of the Sicilian school already would have deserved careful attention. In addition, two of the most influential thinkers of antiquity, Aristotle and Zeno of Citium, founder of Stoicism, made of those ideas the foundation of their respective doctrines of the soul, and especially in Zeno's case, of a whole interpretation of the microcosm as well as the macrocosm based on analogy. Two pieces of evidence, unequal in value, indicate a connection between Plato and Sicilian medicine. Around 370 to 360, a proponent of the latter, Philistion, was sojourning in Athens. This is historical, and would be without significance if it were not confirmed by the presence in Plato's work of elements borrowed from teachings of the Sicilians and the Hippocratics. Since the question is only of marginal interest to us, we shall refrain from dealing with it exhaustively. The Stoics' interest in the theory of sensory knowledge is well known, and we shall return to it. We might assume that this is just one of many debts owed to Sicilian medicine, for we shall observe later that the medicine of the Noematic school and of Galen took up such matters. Sometimes it is through the nexus of Stoicism that we can reconstruct the earliest medical thinking, where more direct evidence is lacking. Plato does not adopt the concept of noima, but his explanations of the mechanics of sight, Timaeus 45b to d, and of hearing, Timaeus 67b, with similarities to Stoic and medical ideas of the later stage of development, could derive from the teachings of the Sicilians. The formation of optical images is not without affinity to the principle of radar. The eyes, depositories of an internal fire, project an igneous ray through the pupils. A ray that meets the external fire projected by sensory bodies outside themselves. Aristotle, De Anima, 428a, will reduce the number of fires to one, specifically the external fire, which, in the act of seeing, is reflected in the ocular membranes. For Plato, hearing results from the impact of sound wave on the ears, an impact that is transmitted to the brains and the blood, thus to arrive at the soul, Timaeus 67b. His explanation is akin to one the Stoics are to give to this phenomenon later, except that, for the Stoics, sound wave is called vocal noima. 
after Plato, more direct contact is established between the Sicilian medical doctrines and the great thinkers of the period, thanks largely to the remarkable work of Diocles of Charistus, a contemporary, if not a precursor, of Aristotle. It is still premature to make a statement about what the latter owes to Diocles, in any case by comparing the Aristotelian theory of the phantasmic noima with the Stoic concept of hegemonicon, or principle of the soul, a concept built up by the Stoics based on hypotheses of Empedoclean medicine, it is possible, if not necessary, to conclude that it was Diocles who inspired Aristotle and not the reverse. For Zeno, the hypotheses stemming from the teachings of Diocles, especially the medical concept of the noima, form the skeleton of a whole micro- and macrocosmic theory, representing the greatest attempt by the human mind to reconcile man with the world, the low with the high. Built upon the Stoic synthesis, magic in late antiquity, whose principles reappear, perfected in magic in the Renaissance, is but a practical continuation of the Empedoclean medical theories as re-elaborated by the Stoics. Whereas for Aristotle the noima was just a thin casing around the soul, for the Stoics as well as for the doctors, the noima is the soul itself, which penetrates the whole human body, controlling all its activities, movement, the five senses, excretion and the secretion of sperm. The Stoic theory of sensory knowledge is not unrelated to that of Aristotle, a cardiac synthesizer. The hegemonic principle, hegemonicon, receives all the pneumatic currents transmitted to it by the sensory organs and produced by the comprehensible phantasms, phantasia cataleptici, apprehended by the intellect. This has only the means to recognize prints made upon the soul, typosis in psyche, produced by the principle which, like a spider in its web, from its seat in the heart, the body centre, is on the lookout for all information transmitted to it by the peripheral senses. For Chrysippus, the perception of an object would occur by means of a pneumatic current which, taking off from the hegemonicon, goes towards the pupil of the eye where it enters in contact with the air situated between the organ of vision and the perceptible object. That contact produces in the air a certain tension which spreads in the shape of a cone whose summit is in the eye and whose base delimits our visual field. A corresponding pneumatic circulation animates the five senses as well as producing voice and sperm. The later Stoics, like Epictetus, perhaps inspired by Platonic radar, even go so far as to say that in the act of looking, the noima outstrips the sensory organ to enter into contact with the tangible object and bring the image perceived back to the hegemonicon. Stemming from ancient medical theories but perfected by the Stoics, the theory of noimatic cognition re-enters by way of the school of the physician Athenaeus, founded in Rome in the first century, the discipline from which it came. According to the doctrine of noematic physicians, whose principal advocate was Archigenes of Apamea in Syria, practicing in Rome under the Emperor Trajan, the hegemonicon does not enter directly into the process of sensory cognition. The great Galen, 2nd century doctor, takes inspiration from the noematics in it. He no longer asserts that the hegemonicon is located in the human heart, but contends it is in the brain instead. He accords it, however, the important function of synesthesis, of synthetization of pneumatic information. I cannot dwell here on the fate of Galen in the Middle Ages, his works were used and thus preserved by Arab medicine. The cultural event that some would call the 12th century Renaissance signals the rediscovery of Greek antiquity through Arab channels. Galen reappeared in European culture through translations in Latin of Arab writers. At the beginning of the 13th century, medieval encyclopedias record new knowledge which will become thereafter a common good of that period. One of the most famous synopses of the time was De 
Proprietatibus Rerum Libri 19, drafted between 1230 and 1250 by a friar minor, Bartholomaeus Anglicus, who had taught at Magdeburg and at the Sorbonne. The countless, in- the countless Incunabula, the 18 editions, and the translation into six vernacular languages are inadequate to give an idea of the prestige, alas, greatly superior to the value of this mediocre work. A significant fact is that at the beginning of the 14th century, the copy which had belonged to Pierre de Limoges was chained to the pulpit of the chapel of the University of Paris. The psychology of intellectual faculties, or the theory of qualities of the soul, is expounded by Bartholomaeus in the third book of his Synopsis, following Latin translations from the Arabic, such as Hesagog in Medicinum, Hesagogi in Medicinum, by Hunain ibn Ishaq, alias Johannesius, Iraqi physician for the not of the 9th century. The writings of Constantine the African, or compilations like De Motu Cordis by Alfred the English, and the Pseudo Augustinian De Spiritu et Anima, 12th century work now attributed to Hugh of Saint Victor, or perhaps more likely to Alca of Clairvaux. In that doctrine, rather clumsily summarised by Bartholomaeus, in which Galenism and Aristotelianism commingle, the human soul is divided into three parts, the rational or intellectual soul, eternal, incorruptible, or immortal, the sensitive soul, composed of spiritual substance, and the vegetative soul. The vegetative soul is common to men and plants, the sensitive soul is common to men and animals, while the intellective soul belongs to man alone. The vegetative soul produces the generation, conservation and growth of bodies. It controls nutritive, digestive and excretory functions. The sensitive soul, that which interests us here, has three faculties, natural, vital and animal. It seems that through the natural faculty which resides in the liver and is transmitted to the body through venous circulation, the sensitive soul only takes upon itself the functions of the vegetative soul, those of nutrition, generation and growth. The seat of the vital or spiritual faculty is the heart, which spreads life through the entire organism by means of the spirit circulating in the arteries. As for the animal faculty, it seat is the brain. It is divided in three, ordinatua, sensitua, and motua. The distinction between the first two is quite difficult to grasp, so much so that elsewhere Bartholomaeus himself forgets what it is, dwelling only on the description of the sensory faculty. The chamber, or anterior ventricle of the brain, seat of the imagination, or, according to Bartholomaeus, of the virtus imaginatua, a branch of the ordinatua, is filled with nerve endings which establish communication with the sensory organs. The same spirit, here called sensory, circulates in the nerves and arteries, which makes us believe that Originally, the doctrines expounded by Bartholomaeus were based on the idea prevalent in Arab medicine that the heart is the unique generator of the vital spirit, which, once it has reached the brain, is called sensitive. The messages of the five external senses are transported by the spirit to the brain, where the inner or common sense resides. The action of common sense is, according to Bartholomaeus, that of the virtus ordinativa, which occupies the three cerebral ventricles, the anterior, seat of the imagination, the median, seat of reason, and the posterior, seat of memory. Imagination translates the language of the senses into fantastic language, so that reason may grasp and understand phantasms. The data of imagination and of reason are deposited in the memory. 
Bartholomaeus is merely a faithful reflection of the concepts of an entire period shared by Albert the Great, Roger Bacon and Thomas Aquinas. Most of his theories were already available in Latin from the second half of the 11th century when, after a life of adventure, the Carthaginian physician Constantine the African found peace in the cloisters of Monte Cassino and devoted himself to the translation of Arab medical works, which circulated for a long time under his own name. Finally, in the 12th century, the great translator, Gerard of Cremona, installed in the college of the Archbishop Raymond in Toledo, rendered, among other works, a Latin version of the works of Avicenna, in which the theory of phantasmic synthesis and the compartments of the brain were already commonplace. Section 2. Flux and Reflux of Values in the 12th Century The originality of an era is not measured by the content of its ideological systems, but rather by its selective will, that is, according to the interpretive grey it interposes between pre-existing contents and their modern treatment. The passing of a message through the hermeneutic filter of an era produces two results of a semantic kind. The first, aiming at the very organisation of the cultural structure of the time, and hence located outside it, is set forth as a complex and subtle mechanism of emphasis, or, on the contrary, of suppression of certain ideological contents. The second, which operates in the very interior of a cultural structure, is set forth as a systematic distortion, or even a semantic inversion of ideas which pass through the interpretive gree of the era. All this means that the crowning wish of the historian of ideas is not, or should not be, to define the ideological contents of a given period, which are fundamentally recursive in nature, but to glimpse its hermeneutic filter, its selective will, which is at the same time a will to distort. An ideology can be described... A system of interpretation, the only one that counts because it alone can show what the originality of one cultural moment in time relative to every other is capable of, is imperceptible. An implicit, if not a hidden presence, but also an objective and ineluctable one. It is revealed stealthily in all its complexity, only to immediately escape the observation of the investigator. In order for him to practice the history of ideas, he is called upon to see not only what is preeminently revealed, the ideas themselves, but precisely that which is not revealed, the hidden threads that link ideas to the invisible will of the time, their producer. Ideas are seen by everyone. The historian of ideas is supposed to look in the wings, to contemplate another aspect of the theatre, the stage, seen from within. It is impossible to observe the Renaissance of the 15th century without having first glanced at the Renaissance of the 12th. Theories about phantasmic eros were developed in the course of the latter to reach their apogee, which soon degenerated into affectation in the poetry of the Dolce Stil Novo. The selective will of the Italian Renaissance pays a good deal of attention to the often fastidious works of its 13th century precursors in order to fit them into its own system of interpretation. It is not purely out of kindness that Marsilio Ficino, whose treatise on love was written for use by a descendant of Guido Cavalcanti, sets forth in detail some of Cavalcanti's erotic theories. As one of the principal representatives of the Fideli di Amore, Guido Cavalcante developed an empirical psychology of Eros that does not differ essentially from that of Ficino. The case of Pico della Mirandola, which we shall analyse in chapter 3, is more complicated. It would be called a striking example of the Oedipus complex if that term had not fallen into disuse through repeated abuse. Stimulated, or rather irritated, by Ficino's little masterpiece on love, Pico abandons all courtesy and tries to refute it in toto. 
That is why he attacks Guivo Cavalcante for lacking profundity, and holds up as a model for a love poem a canzone by his own friend, Girolamo Beneviani, in which he undertakes a commentary. The example of Pico is highly significant. The young man forgets what elsewhere he reveals he knows only too well. In particular, that a cultural era is not defined by the content of the ideas it conveys, but by its interpretive filter. It demands of Guido Cavalcanti that which Ficino, more subtle in this respect, would never have asked. To wit, that he already used the Platonistic interpretations of the 15th century. Bene Vieni's canzona only differs from a canzona by Cavalcante in that it furnishes directly to Pico della Mirandola the interpretation he would have made even in the absence of the poem, because it was his own interpretation of Eros in general. The Platonistic reading of Cavalcante signified to Ficino a hermeneutic bias which also allowed him to pay tribute to a precursor and to the ancestor of someone he liked. Now, in rejecting a real object for interpretation, because the difference between his commentary and the text commentated is only prosodic, the former being in prose, the latter in verse, Pico peremptorily rejects all hermeneutics. For Ficino, Cavalcanti exists to the extent he said something interpretable. For Pico, he does not exist, since he does not provide something already interpreted, as was the case with his friend Benny Vieni. As for the rest of it, there is no great fundamental difference between Ficino's and Pico's theories, although Pico, later, although Pico later constantly censures Ficino for the vulgarity of his approach to questions of love. Whether expressed in a polite or positive way, as by Ficino, or in the contemptuous and negative manner of Pico, it is certain that the Florentine Renaissance takes chronological precedence over the rediscovery of the other Renaissance, that of the 12th and 13th centuries. Modern scholars, who sometimes confuse the rediscovery with the summarizing or literal resumption of the same ideas, accord such precedence only to Mario Equicola, interpreter of Provençal poetry in his Libro de Natura de Amore, of which the Latin original, on which the Italian translation of 1509-11, to published in 1525, was based, dates back to the years 1494-96, to right after the death of Pico. Now, it is true that Mario Equicola refers directly to the lyric style of the troubadours, whereas Cavalcanti, in whom Ficino discovers a precursor, is only the later representative of an Italian school, which, also profiting from the lessons of the Sicilian school, and in competition with the school of Bologna, replaces the code of the troubadours with one that is more rigid and scientific. Of course, the two examples are not superimposable, but Stilnovism and Provençal poetry both stem from the same existential root of courtly love. Acculturation of the West The observer of ideas and currents taking place on the 12th century stage is frustrated by their variety. A quick foray into the wings, which few have yet dared to attempt, shows us that many strings are held in the same hand, the same selective will, perhaps. The phenomenon that characterises the movements of ideas in the 12th century might be compared to a huge flux and reflux of data and cultural values. Spain at the time of the Reconquista is one of the most important centres. In proportion, as the Christian kingdom of Castile advances and the Arabs retreat, specialists, or adventurers, throng the field, fascinated by the wealth and culture of the Muslims, and begin their feverish work of translation in which wonder and religious controversy intermingle. Quickly, due chiefly to the College of Translators installed at Toledo, the Latin West comes into contact with the principal records of Arab culture and of Greek antiquity in the fields of medicine, philosophy, alchemy, and religion. The latter remains subject to rebuttal, and Rodriguez Simenez de Rada, or Peter the Venerable, Abbot of Cluny, carries out his task conscientiously. 
Their philosophy offers food for thought. In any case, it was not accepted at once and without changes, unless by chance a Jewish philosopher of Cordoba, such as Solomon ibn Gabirol, happened, under the Latinized name of Avicebron, Avencobrol, or Avem Kembron, to pass for Christian. But as soon as the Arab Aristotle and the Greek Aristotle were discovered, scholasticism had found its man. No authority until the recent until the rediscovery of Plato and of pagan Neoplatonism could give that master any competition. Medicine had the same fate. It was adopted immediately, especially because the Galenism of the Arabs concurred on many points with the doctrines of Aristotle. The time of the great syntheses, or Summe, had come. With regard to the Arab culture of Spain, it is more difficult to specify what is carried away in its reflux. Perhaps traces of Christian mysticism evident in Ibn Arabi, the great Sufi master of the 13th century. Be that as it may, those who stood to profit from the exchange of values were primarily the Christians. This process of acculturation that occurred in the western end of Europe was also accompanied by infiltration of elements from the east, threatening the bases of medieval society with disintegration. Long disguised under other names, or simply remaining hidden, the ancient universalistic gnosis of Mani reappeared in the 10th century, in the teachings of the Bulgarian pope Bogomil. Bogomilism, which had quickly come to Byzantium, showed off the whole arsenal of dualistic gnoses. It held the adversary of God to be the creator of the visible world and inspirer of the Old Testament, which was rejected in one lump, or almost so. It preached incretism, or abstention from marriage and sexual relations in order not to perpetuate Satan's evil doings, and vegetarianism to avoid incorporating the satanic element present in animals. It also preached antinomianism, or non-obedience to laws formulated by the civil and religious authorities. Catharism, which appears towards the end of the first half of the 12th century, probably represents the western branch of Bogomilism. Sporadic traces of dualistic gnosis, however, appear from the beginning of the 11th century in France and Italy. A group of noblemen and priests from Orleans around 1015 practiced incretism, vegetarianism, and docetism, the idea that Christ never assumed a real human body, this also constituting part of the dualistic dogma. A second example in Montfort in Piedmont closely resembles that of Orleans, both in the nature of its belief and the composition of its group. Anti-clerical, docetist, antinomian, incretite, and vegetarian, they also presage the Catharan Endura, with the idea that the members of their sect nearing death should be ritually killed in order to spare them death throes. At the beginning of the 12th century, the Bogomil influences are revealed in the anti-clerical and iconoclastic heresy of Peter of Bruis and the itinerant preacher Henry, as well as in the profession of dualistic faith of two peasants from Soissons, Clement and Ebrard, 1114. Tanshelm of Anvers and Uido Aeon of L'Etoile, both very strange people, seem to have been inspired by the Gnosticism of the first centuries AD, the former being especially influenced by Simon the Magician of Samaria. Perhaps this was a spontaneous inspiration, coming from the innermost depths of the collective unconscious, since both men were declared insane by some of their contemporaries, as indeed they are by modern scholars. The Cathars, Puritan dualists of the 12th and 13th centuries, were alone in organising themselves along the lines of the Bogomils into powerful churches, which, in southern France and northern Italy, became a real threat to the Catholic Church. It was in the fight against the Cathars that the Church created and perfected the shocking agency of the Inquisition. The difference between the Cathars and the heretics of Orleans and Montfort is not to be sought on the ideological level, but rather on a level of practical power, which the Cathars attained by means of their active preaching. Although they rationalised their dogma in a different way than the people from Orleans and Montfort, 
the Cathars professed no less than anti-cosmism, opposition to the evil world created by Satan, docetism, incretism, antinomianism, anti-clericalism and vegetarianism, or almost since fish which they maintained were generated spontaneously and non-sexually by water, were not excluded from their lean repasts. All the... All that interests us here is the codification of theories about love in the 12th and 13th centuries, and not the history of medieval dualism. Now, it is very important that the Cathars' code of morals in principle Puritan did not exclude, in certain cases, licentiousness, a grave form of antinomianism with respect to the social regulations for Catholics. The Cathars, being incretite, did not permit marriage. Legitima Connubia damnant, matrimonium est meretricium, matrimonium est lupina, they declared in opposing such legalization of concubinage. They absolutely proscribe marriage, the inquisitor Bernardus Guidonis tells us. They assert that it is a perpetual state of sin. They deny the good Lord ever instituted it. They declare that carnal knowledge of a wife is no less a sin than incestuous relations with a mother, daughter, or sister. On the other hand, given that the path of Cathar initiation went from mere believer to the perfect one, sexual lapse of believers was openly, publique, allowed, provided that it not bear the legal seal of marriage, because it was much more weighty to make love to a wife than to another. Faceri cum uxore suaquam cum alia mulier. This opened the way to a sexual licentiousness that the Catholic Church feared at least as much as the dualistic dogma of the Cathars because of its antisocial and anti demographic consequences. The cultural flux that swamped Western Europe from west to east, which resulted in the scholasticism of the early Middle Ages as well as the dualistic sects, can be considered an important phenomenon. When the tide receded, the influences coming from the west and those coming from the east were united in the strange and original ideology of courtly love. Courtly love has in common with Catharism a contempt for marriage and an ambiguous message which though opposed in principle to sexual intercourse, is contradicted in practice by the licentious behaviour of the troubadours. Like the Cathar faithful, some of them seemed systematically to have indulged in debauchery. The phenomenon of courtly love was, has, however, more in common with Arab medicine and mysticism, which nevertheless does not negate the hypothesis of a dual origin. Ideal idealization and even hypostatization of woman, a vital component of Courtney love, had long imbued Arab mystical poetry. The latter, moreover, did not escape the charge of dualism, a phenomenon meeting with the same intolerance both of Muslims and Christians. In 783, the poet Bash Shah ibn Burd was sentenced to death as a Zindic or crypto manichaean hence a Cathar ahead of his time. Quote, because he had identified the woman to whom he had dedicated his poem with spirit or ru, the intermediary between man and God, end quote. Only unattainable womanhood can be deified, and R. Boes recalls as a Cathar adjunct to the story of Bash Shah that Gervaise of Tilbury sent a young girl to the stake only because she had resisted his erotic advances. In Islam, the identification of woman as suprasensory entity was more or less current without lacking ambiguity. For the Sufi mystic Sana'i, who died about 1150, a Madonna intelligentsia hidden behind the features of a woman was the pilgrim's guide in the cosmos of the Neoplatonists of Islam. He was at the same time the author of one of the most dreadful diatribes against women ever conceived. It is probably a question of the dual aspect of the feminine, the natural aspect which prompts and justifies the misogyny of the ascetic man, and the essential aspect uh, under which woman is the other half of heaven. Mitigating the contradiction between these two separate aspects of the feminine, the Sufi mystic Ibn Arabi of Murkia 
considers woman merely an ideal species. In Mecca in 1201, he, de- he composes a divan dedicated to Netzam, Harmony, daughter of an imam noble of Persian origin, Zahir ibn Rostam, entitled The Interpreter of Burning Desires. The divan's prologue contains these intimate confessions. A lengthy quote. Now this sheikh had a daughter, a slender and willowy adolescent who attracted the attention of anyone who saw her, whose presence alone was the embellishment of public meetings and struck with amazement all who looked upon her. Her name was Netzam, Harmonia, and her surname, Eye of the Sun and of Beauty. Scholarly and pious with experience of the spiritual and mystical life, she personified the venerable antiquity of the Holy Land and the innocent youth of the Prophet's great city. The magic of her glance, the grace of her conversation was so enchanting that if she happened to be prolix, her speech was filled with references. If concise, a marvel of eloquence, holding forth on a subject clear and lucid, were it not for petty minds eager for scandal and inclined to slander, I would hear comment on the beauty that God lavished on her body as well as on her soul, which was a garden of generosity. At the time I used to visit her, I carefully observed the noble qualities of her person, besides what the company of her aunt and her father added to it. Thus I took her as the prototype for inspiration of the poems contained in this book, love poems composed of elegant and sweet phrases. Albeit, I have not been able to succeed in expressing even part of the emotion in my soul that meeting this young girl aroused in my heart, nor the wholehearted love I felt, nor the stamp that her continuous friendship left on my memory, nor the grace of her spirit and her modesty of demeanour, because she is the object of my quest and of my hope, the purest virgin. Nevertheless, I have succeeded in putting into verse some of my nostalgic thoughts like precious objects offered here. I have clearly expressed my smitten soul. I have wished to suggest the deep attachment that I felt, the deep solicitude that troubled me during the period that has elapsed and the sorrowful longing that still moves me when I think of the exalted companionship of this young girl. End quote. Although Ibn Arabi is at great pains to specify that his poems are symbolic, that the visible beauties only evoke the suprasensory realities of the world of angelic meanings, a doctor from Aleppo accuses him of having concealed a sensual love in order to save his reputation for, for austerity. The personage, real or fictional, here fills the place he deserved. The moralist who interferes in order to question the purity of intent of the lover, and who arouses the very protests of the lover that form the explanation of courtly love. What is, what is involved here is not just a personage, but a function in the structure of the literary and existential style cultivated by love's faithful, from the troubadours to Dante. To refute these vulgar insinuations, Ibn Arabi decides to write his long commentary on the divan in which he explains that Henry Corbin, what Henry Corbin's calls the manner of theophanic apperception, typical of love's faithful. Hence, Netzam becomes a sublime and divine wisdom, Sophia, fundamental and sacrosanct, who reveals herself visibly to the author of these poems with such sweetness as to engender in him joy and rapture, delight and ecstasy. The intelligential beauty revealed in the sensory beauty, sensory beauty of the feminine is the expression, optimistic and moving, of the Platonism of the Andalusian mystic. The corollary of this conception is dual, that which belongs to the intelligential is endowed with feminine beauty, like the angel appearing with the features of a princess of the Greeks. Second, everything influenced by the intelligential shares in the virginal virtues, like Saint Fatima of Cordova, who, at the age of 90, still looks like a young girl. Contrary to Sana'i, who states that the sensory world is a trap in which beauty does not correspond to an ontological quality, Ibn Arabi is completely indifferent to that truth, only retaining the idea of a continuum between sensory beauty and intelligential beauty. 
This said concerning the idealization of feminine beings, it behooves us to return to the believers in love in the West. One of the most striking aspects of courtly love is the vocation of suffering on the part of the faithful. The occultation of love represents an essential element of the ritual of eroticism. In this process of voluntary withdrawal from the love object, a withdrawal that causes the indefinite postponement of the consummation of desire is to be seen one of the secrets of Western tradition. No obstacle is too great in this case, including one set up by the lover himself in adopting fickle conduct, conveying a mood of public defiance. His purpose in this voluntary fickleness is to obtain not the favours, but rather the contempt of the beloved, so that this may increase her unattainability. Instead of assuaging his pangs of passion, the faithful lover employs every means to increase them. He has a divine call to be ill, and refuses to be cured by the vulgar method of appeasing desire either furtively, like lovers, or legally, like married people. That eros can take pathological forms is not new in the history of medicine. An allusion to the cogitatio immoderata aroused by a female image even appears in the very conventional treatise On Love by Andreas Capellanos, a 12th century Puritan who had the misfortune to be mistaken for a cathar. Quote, when a man sees a woman deserving of erotic attentions, he at once begins to desire her with his whole heart. Then, the more he thinks of it, the more he feels himself imbued with love, until he reconstructs her in his entirety in fantasy. Then he begins to think of her figure. He perceives her limbs, imagines them in action, and explores the private parts of her body. End quote. The feminine phantasm can then take entire possession of the pneumatic system of the lover, producing, unless desire finds its natural outlet, somatic disturbances of a quite vexing sort. Called Ishk, this syndrome of love is described by Avicenna, whose Liber Canonis was the manual of medicine in use in the early Christian Middle Ages. But previously, Constantine the African had spoken of it in his translation of Liber Regius of Ali ibn Abbas al Majusi, called Heli Abbas. After Constantine, the semiology of the pathological eros is described by Arnaldus of Villanova and by Vincent of Beauvais, who classify it among the varieties of melancholia. The name of the syndrome is Amor herios, or Latinized heroicus, as its etymology is still in doubt. It might be derived, derived from the Greek eros, corrupted heros, love, or directly from heros, hero, for heroes represented, according to ancient tradition, evil aerial influences similar to devils. The relationship between Melancholia nigra et canina and Amor herios is explainable by virtue of the fact that abnormal erotic phenomena were associated, ever since Aristotle, with the melancholic syndrome. According to that tradition, Saint Hildegard of Bingen, died 1179, attributes to melancholics unlimited sexual capacities. Quote, Melancholics have big bones that contain little marrow, like vipers. They are excessively libidinous and, like donkeys, overdo it with women. If they desisted from this depravity, madness would result. Their love is hateful, twisted and death-carrying, like the love of voracious wolves. They have intercourse with women, but they hate them. End quote. Ficino himself admits the relationship between melancholy and erotic pathology. And melancholon makes them one and the same thing in his turn of phrase, melancholia illa eroica. The most complete etiology of the illness is found in the section De Amore qui Herios Dicitur in the Lilium Medicinal of Dr. Bernard of Gordon, 1258-1318, professor at Montpellier. Quote, 
The illness called Herios is melancholy anguish caused by love for a woman. The cause of this affliction lies in the corruption of the faculty to evaluate due to a figure and a face that have made a very strong impression. When a man is in love with a woman, he thinks exaggeratedly of her figure, her face, her behaviour, believing her to be the most beautiful, the most worthy of respect, the most extraordinary with the best build and body and soul that there can be. This is why he desires her passionately, forgetting all sense of proportion and common sense, and thinks that if he could satisfy his desire, he would be happy. To so great an extent is his judgment distorted that he constantly thinks of the woman's figure and abandons all his activities so that if someone speaks to him, he hardly hears him. And since this entails continuous contemplation, it can be defined as melancholy anguish. It is called Herios because noblemen and lords of the manor, because of plenty of pleasures and delights, often were overcome by this affliction. End quote. The semiology of the syndrome is as follow. The symptoms are lack of sleep, food and drink. The whole body weakens except the eyes. He also mentions emotional instability, irregular pulse and ambulatory mania. The prognosis is worrisome. If they are not treated, they become maniacal and they die. Finally, the treatment should begin with gentle methods such as persuasion or strong ones such as whipping. The pursuit of erotic pleasures with several women, natural diversions, coito, digiunio, ebrieta e esercizio, as Ficino is to recommend. Only, if there is no other remedy, the Dr. Bernard de Gordon, professor and practitioner, advises that there be recourse to the talents of an old and horrible shrew to stage a dramatic scene. Under her clothes, the old woman should wear a rag soaked in menstrual blood. In full view of the patient, she should first utter the worst invectives regarding the woman he loves, and if that proves useless, she should remove the rag from her bosom, wave it under his nose, wave it under the nose of the unhappy man, and shout in his face, Your friend, she is like this, she is like this, suggesting that she is only as the Malleus Maleficarum is to say, a bane of nature. Exhausted, the doctor draws his conclusion. If, after all that, he does not change his mind, then he is not a man, but the devil incarnate. How a woman, who is so big, penetrates the eyes, which are so small. If we closely examine Bernard of Gordon's long description of Amor Herios, we observe that it deals with a phantasmic infection finding expression in the subject's melancholic wasting away, except for the eyes. Why are the eyes accepted? Because the very image of the woman has entered the spirit through the eyes and through the optic nerve has been transmitted to the sensory spirit that forms common sense. Transformed into phantasm, the obsessional image has invaded the territory of the three ventricles of the brain, inducing a disordered state of the reasoning faculty, virtus estimativa, which resides in the second cerebral cell. If the eyes do not partake of the organism's general decay, it is because the spirit uses those corporeal apertures to try to establish contact with the object that was converted into the obsessing phantasm. The woman. The second thing worthy of note is that the erotic syndrome only represents the medical semiology of necessity. Negative, since we are in the realm of psychosomatic pathology, of the courtly love glorified by the faithful. Indeed, they seem to use every means not only to escape that baneful infection, but on the contrary, to catch it. Quite rightly, mention has been made of a semantic reversal, a reverse valorization of the pathologic symptoms described by the Greco Arab Materia Medica. Even the locus amoinus, recommended in the treatment of Herios' love, reappears in Provençal poetry, as we know it. We must deduce from this that the phenomenon of courtly love results from a warped purpose that 
brought about a shift of emphasis concerning the concept of health as defined by medical science at the time. Through this umvertung, the gloomy equilibrium of psychic forces recommended by learned treatises was transformed into a sickness of the intellect, whereas, on the contrary, the spiritual sickness induced by love ended by being extolled as the real health of body and soul. But, and here we disagree with G. Agamben, this reversal of evaluation did not take place in Provencal poetry, beginning with the syndrome of Amor Herios, but well before, in Sufi mysticism, with the equivalent attitude of Ishk, described by Avicenna. Even the paradoxical attitude of love's faithful, which consists in feigning frivolous and licentious behaviour, the better to keep the pure flame of passion burning, is presaged by the Sufi attitude called Malamatiya, which consists, according to the definition received by Ibn Arabi from the magician Abu Yahya al Sinhachi, in concealing holiness beneath apparent licentiousness of behaviour. The semantic reversal of the concept of psychophysical health is spelled out in the Dolce Stil Novo, which describes in detail the process of phantasmic infection caused by the feminine image. In the fact that this symptom becomes the object of a supreme spiritual experience resides the secret of love's faithful. It amounts to saying that the gentle heart, far from following the precepts of medical science, becomes ennobled by proportion as it turns to account the delights of the sickness that consumes it. That sickness is precisely the experience described by Guido Cavalcanti, continuing from the moment the visual spirit intercepts the woman's image and transmits it into the anterior cell of the brain, seat of the imaginative faculty, until the moment the feminine phantasm has infested the whole noima and spreads from now on through the spiritual canals of the febrile organism. No one will be astonished that the poet Giacomo de Lentino should ask this seemingly childish question, how can it be that so large a woman has been able to penetrate my eyes, which are so small, and then enter my heart and my brain? The physicians of antiquity, like Galen, were also fascinated by the same phenomenon. See ergo ad visum exri videnda aliquid dirigitur, quomodo illum angustum foramen entrari poterit. Averos answers the astonishment, feigned, of both parties. It is not a corporeal impression, but a phantasmic one. Common sense receives the phantasms on the side of the retina and transmits them to the imaginative faculty. Dante goes further in his erotic pneumo phantasmology. In Sonnet 21 of his Vita Nova, he envisages the lady as the recipient of spirit overflowing through eyes and mouth. Miracolo Gentil. His experience does not pine away in an interior pneumatic circle, but represents, in a certain way, a decanting of spirit which takes for granted, albeit involuntarily, some reciprocity of desire. Through a kind of significatio perceiva, what was the object of covetous desire is transformed into a subject whence love em emanates. But emanates without being aware of it, virginal innocence that only increases the pangs of passion, the exquisite torment of love's faithful. With his Vita Nova, Dante also enters a mysterious realm that our rudiments of medieval psychology are inadequate to explain. Dream. Vision. Section 3. The Vehicle of the Soul and Prenatal Experience That empirical psychology regarding Eros which will recur in Ficino was inadequate to satisfy Renaissance demands for depth in thought. The theory of phantasmic knowing merely represented the last link in a huge body of dogma related to the noima and the soul. 
As we shall see, the connection between Eros and magic is so close that differentiation between them is a matter of degree. A phantasmic experience carried out through the spiritual channels with which we are already acquainted. Magic makes use of the continuity between the individual noima and the cosmic one. This is the same universal noematic combination that justifies the depth psychology of Eros. Through the doctrine of incorporation of the soul, not only is the continuity of the noima demonstrated, but also the cosmic nature of all spiritual activity. It is, of course, a rather refined form of speculation on the relations between microcosm and macrocosm, along with a dual projection that leads to a cosmization of man and to the anthropomorphization of the universe. This principle, which historians of science never cease to repeat, unaware that it is a simple schema permitting countless variations, is so generic that it does not succeed in explaining anything at all. How can man be a compendium of the cosmos, and, after all, a compendium of what cosmos? Those are problems whose solution is far from univocal, and one need only to have read a good history of philosophy to know it. The Renaissance knows not only one, but at least four types of cosmos. The geocentric and finite cosmos of Aristotle, Ptolemy, and St. Thomas. The infinite cosmos of Nicholas of Cusa, of which God is the omnipresent centre. The cosmos of Aristarchus and the Pythagoreans, as exemplified by the heliostatic theory of Copernicus. And finally, the infinite universe of Giordano Bruno, which integrates our heliocentric planetary system. We might add to the above the ancient geo-heliocentric theory of Plato's disciple, Heraclides Ponticus, never wholly discarded in the Middle Ages and taken up again by Tycho Brahe. None of those cosmological systems excludes the hypothesis of magic, since it is based on the idea of continuity between man and the world, which could not be upset simply by changing theories about the structure of the world. Magicians such as Giordano Bruno or Pythagorean astrologers like Kepler have no difficulty in conforming to the new philosophy. What does change from one cosmos to another is only the idea of the dignity of the earth and of man, and there too considerable doctrinal variation exists. In the Aristotelian universe, the earth occupies the lowest position, actually corresponding to its ontological inferiority, since it is the site of impermanence, rapid changes of generation and corruption. Everything existing this side of the sublunar sphere is relegated, so to speak, to a kind of cosmic hell from which escape can only be made by going beyond the moon. On the other hand, the planetary spheres are divine, and beyond the sky of fixed stars begin the dwelling places of God. Perhaps as a joke, but also as a result of the fact that the earth was only a fallen, heavily body, Nicolas Oresme was already wondering in the 14th century if the idea of the fixedness of the earth was not incompatible with its inferiority. Actually, fixedness means stability, and it is the stars of the eighth sky that are fixed because they are superior to the moving stars. That is why Nicolas Oresme hypothesizes the movement of the earth, which is too vile to be immobile. The profound philosophic reason for which Nicholas of Cusa maintains the idea of the infinity of the universe stems from a conception diametrically opposed to that of Oresme. Cusanus rejects the Aristotelian theory of the elements. For him, there is no differentiation in the cosmos, neither ontological nor spatial, between high and low, above and below. There is no incorruptible world of ether and pure fire beyond the lunar sphere, nor is there a corruptible one formed of the four elements this side of the moon. The world is spherical and turns on its axis. Aristotle's concept, according to which the earth is very vile and low, terra ista sit vilissima et infima, is untrue. The earth is a noble star with its light, its heat, and its own influence, which differs from the other stars. Cusanus's effort, like that of Giordano Bruno, later his disciple, was directed towards the re-evaluation of the metaphysical prestige of the earth, 
hence of man, a prestige it had lost through Aristotelian Ptolemaean cosmology, a fundamental reform of Christianity as envisaged in this new concept of the world, but a reform whose humanistic, not to mention anthropocentric nature, accepts and encourages magic. Ficino, the classic source of the revival of magic, is only dimly aware of Cusanus' ideas, but once it was accepted that there is no incompatibility between Cusanus's system of the world and the ancient astrological magic espoused by Ficino, it is of small importance that Ficino himself adopted the traditional Ptolemaic cosmology and astrology. With the ideas he endorsed, Nicholas of Cusa might easily have worked on magic, but that was probably of slight interest for a pure metaphysician, metaphysician of his kind. As to Ficino, except for his Thomism and his Platonism, which forced the cosmological system upon him, he is not so far from Kepler, who studies Pythagorean astral music. The concepts of the world, the inner aspirations and motivations of a Ficino and a Kepler, do not essentially differ from one another. On that point, contemporary historians of science no longer have any doubt. We shall attempt in the second part of this book to examine the true ideological causes that produced the change in human imagination, without which the transition from qualitative scientific principles to obviously quantitative principles would not have been possible. For the present, let us go back to the sources of Ficino's doctrine of incorporation, a doctrine that explains to some degree the close relation between man and the world. As with pneumatophantasmology, an ancient discipline, this time astrology engendered the hypothesis of a prenatal cosmic knowledge impressed on the soul in determining the destiny of the individual person. Beginning in the 2nd century BC, this idea coalesced with the story of the incorporation of the soul, its descent into earth and its return to the heavens. Now we fancy that the soul on entering the world assimilates planetary concretions that will yield only on its exit from the cosmos, in the course of the ascension that takes it to the place of its birth. Perfected by the Neoplatonists, the doctrine of the vehicle of the soul will make its glorious re-entry into the astro-magic of Ficino and his disciples. Popular Hellenistic astrology, purportedly fathered by the Egyptian god Hermes Trismegistus, or by Egyptian figures such as the pharaoh Nechepso and his priest Peto Cyrus, comprised several books, mostly lost or only surviving in Latin versions of the Renaissance. It dealt with various questions like Genica, or universal astrology, the Apocatastasis, or cosmic cycles, brontology or divination by thunder, new year predictions, cosmica apitalismata, individual and iatrological, selmeshoi niaka, astrology, fortunes according to the planets, cleroi, malothesy, or correspondence between the planets and the astral information contained in the microcosm. Actually, the medical branch of the discipline was called iatromathematics, pharmacopoeia and pharmacology, etc. In a series of articles of too specialised a kind to permit us to detail the contents here, we have shown that the vulgar gnosis of the 2nd century AD had already incorporated the astrological dogma of cleroi, or fortunes, transforming it into a real passage of the soul through the planets, the soul assimilating increasingly material concretions that link it to the body and to the world here below. The Alexandrian doctor Basilides and his son Isidori, as well as the popular gnosis of the 3rd and 4th centuries which has come down to us through treatises in Coptic discovered at Nag Hammadi and elsewhere, provide us with adequate data concerning the process of corruption of the soul. The Corpus Hermeticum, a collection of pseudo-epigraphic writings composed AD 100 to 300, also relates the descent of primordial man into the cosmos and the passage of the soul through the planets and its re-entry to the heavenly homeland. Reverberations of this purely negative version of incorporation or ensomatosis are still preserved in some passages of the commentary on the Aeneid by the grammarian Servius who wrote towards the end of the 4th century. 
On the contrary, the Neoplatonists, from Porphyry to Proclus, do not attribute to the planets any demonic influence, but only certain qualities, such as the contemplative faculty, practical intelligence, etc., extending as to the begetting of children and growth of the body, qualities the soul reappropriates in the course of its descent and discards in the course of its re-entry into heaven. It is very important that this Neoplatonic vehicle, Ochema, of the soul, whose history has been outlined by G. Verbecker, H. Louis, E. R. Dodds, etc., will in time be confused with Aristotle's pneumatic synthesizer, the sidereal noima, which is innate and transmitted in the act of procreation, De Patu Animalium, 659b16. It matters little that to resolve the contradiction between a vehicle acquired in the skies and a purely terrestrial outer wrapping for the soul, the late Neoplatonists, especially Proclus, have recourse to the theory of two vehicles of the soul. In one way or another, the astral garments of the soul and the rarefied spirit generated by the human heart become as one, which enables Synesius, for instance, pupil of the Neoplatonist Hypatia, who will later become a Christian bishop, to endow this whole phantasmic process with cosmic importance. Actually, the organ of the human imagination is not a substance bereft of other qualities. On the contrary, it entails a system in which prenatal information stemming from the celestial bodies, the cosmic gods, is rigorously recorded. Now, this spiritual relationship of man with the divine has two sides. The one, restrictive, set forth in Ficino's doctrine about eroticism, and the other, reciprocal, allowing the working of magic. Reciprocity, or the principle of inversion of action, is the guarantee that a process that takes place in the phantasmic mind and spirit of the individual will result in obtaining certain gifts the stars grant us by virtue of the consubstantiality and intimate relationships existing between us and them. In the case of Eros, the theory of the astral vehicle makes it possible to establish not only the how of the phenomenon of love, but also its why. It supplies the profound, transcendental reasons for our choice.